JM being an, being a rare orphan disease, um, you know, is simply not going to get the um, attention, um, nor will the funding be available um, to, to really do a 10, 15, $20 million clinical trial that would take five to seven years and, <clears throat> and result in a, um, uh, in, in that, and could result um, in an approved drug for JM. We believe a better path is the repurposed path. In, in other words, taking drugs that um, have already been through uh, 20, 30, 40 million dollar clinical trials that have been approved for other indications, um, typically um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, um, or other auto-inflammatory diseases, uh, and then discovering whether or not they could be effective um, in uh, as a potential therapy for uh, juvenile myositis. Um, there are any number of drugs that are that are going through um, clinical trials right now um, as as we speak. You've probably heard of some of these. Um, one is a is a drug called abatacept, um, which is um, in the last few months of a clinical trial at one of our centers, George Washington U University. Um, it is used occasionally by Dr. Ryder and other clinicians who are are familiar with um, abatacept. Uh, but this small clinical trial, which is um, also funded by, um, by Bristol-Myers Squibb uh, at, at our center, uh, will, will provide the evidence that clinicians need um, to use Abatacep in certain circumstances. Um, in the future, we hope that paper will be uh, done and published within, um, within 12 months, and we can add Abatacep to the arsenal of drugs that are used for um, juvenile myositis. Um, a, a second drug um, that will be entering a second JM clinical trial sometime in 2021, hopefully early 2021, is for a drug called baricitinib, um, uh, which is also an auto-inflammatory um, drug approved for other indications. Um, there has been a small clinical trial in adults and a second clinical trial in children for uh, baricitinib. Um, it's what's known as a JAK-STAT inhibitor. Um, in other words, it, it, it inhibits certain pathways um, of inflammation in the muscle. Uh, and it also is effective in, in treating lesions and, and other skin disease aspects of myositis and juvenile myositis. Uh, very promising early results in a small number of juvenile patients, a larger number of adult patients. Um, and uh, we're, we're hopeful that we will be fully enrolled in, um, in an additional juvenile myositis trial, as I mentioned in, in 2021. And the paper coming out of that trial um, would hopefully, if the trial is successful, uh, provide the evidence that clinicians typically need and want for uh, for off-label use um, of, another, uh, of another drug. There's several other um, um, drugs. Um, one that could be approved primarily for skin conditions. Uh, it's a drug called linobosum. Um, it's in clinical trial in adult myositis and, in, and with adults who have juvenile myositis. Um, <clears throat> that trial is, uh, is, in its, is in phase two. Um, right now, they're about to publish phase two results. That actually would be a drug that, um, uh, that would be approved uh, for adult myositis, ultimately could be approved for juvenile myositis. Um, so it's use again for juvenile myositis until that approval would be forthcoming would for us anyway, for this organization and for, for children with juvenile myositis be, um, be off label. Uh, and then finally, one that, that um, I'm um, most excited about and, and that our, our board has just recently agreed um, to, to fund the development of, uh, of essentially clinical trial protocols uh, for a clinical trial is for a drug called Vomorolone. Uh, Vomorolone is, um, is something that I call the anti-steroid steroid. steroid. 
Um, essentially, it is a, a what would be um, a, a replacement drug uh, for prednisone. Um, its chemical um, uh, composition, if you will, is, is almost identical to prednisone with a few small changes, which essentially means that it is able to, um, uh, to, to, to suppress the immune system in the same way prednisone does, but without um, the side effects that you are all too familiar with. Uh, this drug is um, in phase two slash three clinical trials for another auto-inflammatory disease, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, it is, I, I think I'm safe in saying it, it is likely to see approval uh, by the FDA um, in 2021. Um, we're, we're hopeful to start a clinical trial in JM perhaps in late 2021. That would be, I think, optimistically the soonest that kind of trial could, could start. Um, but it's the same theory, if you will, that we would be looking at with a trial like baricitinib uh, that, that once underway, once the trial design is approved by the FDA, uh, <clears throat> underway it would be a fairly short trial, maybe six months in length, uh, 20 to 24 uh, uh, patients, typical ages. We don't know the, the, the protocol for the trial yet, but the typical ages would probably be something um, like, like 10 to 16, 10 to 18, something in that range. Um, if the FDA approved a couple of children at a, at, a, at a lower age, that might be a possibility. We just, we, we just don't know yet. Um, but but a, a, a six month trial to really look at safety and efficacy of vomorolone um, in JM. We, we don't believe based on um, all of the data that we have, uh, safety data that we have with animals um, and with, uh, and with uh, boys, because, uh, uh, um, excuse me, just went out of my head. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a, is a disease among young boys. Um, we don't have safety data on young girls. Uh, but we don't also believe that will be a significant hurdle for us to cross with the FDA as we as we move forward with uh, with planning for this particular trial. So so vomorolone is a um, is is a game changer for us um, if in fact it proves to be um, effective in in JM. It it has the potential to be. Uh, in my mind, anyway, um, the, the the biggest breakthrough, and uh, and again, in in from in in my view, it's one in which, you know, I, I I think and hope that that our organization will you know will take a strong stand in pushing this through, um, as as quickly as we possibly can. We we will need to. This trial will cost um, about a million dollars um, over and above what uh, what we have in in our current grant budgets uh, today. So so we will need to be busy over the next twelve months in in raising the war chest, so to speak, to have the funding for that trial. We're 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 hopeful, but there's no guarantee that that the NIH might fund half of it, which would mean. Essentially, that would mean we would need to fund the other half, uh, but we'll, you know, we'll have to see how that works out. I think, I think our contribution to the success of this trial will be at a minimum half a million dollars, and if the FDA comes through with less rather than more, it could be, uh, it could be more than that. So that's uh, that, that's really, I think, the the exciting news from from PureJM at at the moment. At least I find it's very exciting. I think we're we're, we're making um, you know, as rapid a progress as I've seen in, in organizations um, of research funding organizations of, you know, of our size and, and scope. Uh, and you know, under Suzanne's leadership with the research committee and the leadership of our entire board, uh, I, think, you know, I think we're convinced that we can go faster yet. So I wanna thank all of you for your ongoing commitments to, um, to, to our financial health, to everything you've done with the development of the, the Seattle Walk Strong and now Walk Strong Across America. And, and I think many of you are participating in the holiday challenge as well. These are, these are all grassroots programs that, um, that 
fuel our research and essentially fund our existence. So, uh, you know, being in an organization that that doesn't rely on government funding and 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 really doesn't have much opportunity to secure much funding from pharmaceutical companies who aren't interested really in orphan or disease organizations like ours. Um, you know, we're really dependent upon what we do from, from, from our grassroots. So I can't thank you enough for, uh, for being with us from the beginning to the end of, of, of this journey. And, uh, and, and I think one day in the very near future, we'll, you know, we'll be seeing online uh, hopefully, you know, at least one, maybe two or three um, new drugs that will be um, important additions to the, uh, the, the somewhat outdated and, and less than perfect arsenal that we have right now. I just named two, two or three of them. There's, um, there's two or three more um, that are potential um, clinical trial um, candidates, they are, um, uh, they are essentially in that list of what I mentioned in, in terms of JAK-STAT inhibitors. So there are drugs like, like baricitinib um, is, is one of them, probably the most promising one at, at the moment. Although a couple of those JAK-STAT stack inhibitors um, apparently have an even stronger indication in JM than baricitinib, but we, we, we don't have a path to a clinical trial for them quite yet. White arthritis right. um, is, is, the most, is, is the most common one. Um, I, think, I think one of the drugs is approved for ulcerative colitis. Um, Suzanne, you might have another um, thought on any of that. Those are the two I'm most familiar with in terms of what the, what the previous approvals have been. They've almost all been in the rheumatoid arthritis area. I'm going to so, ask I'll Dr. Shinoy to answer. I just unmuted myself. So uh, hi, uh, very great news. Uh, one of the cousins of baricitinib, which is tofacitinib, same group of medications, actually got approved two days ago. <laughs> Oh, great. For oh, great. Uh, polyarticular JIA. So it's uh, childhood arthritis and it okay. just got approved. Um, so baricitinib is not formally approved in any kids' diseases yet. I think uh, Jim is right. It's approved for RA and some adult diseases probably, but has been used off label, like Jim said, in a bunch of auto inflammatory diseases. Right. So tofacitinib is yeah. now for uh, polyarticular. Yes, yes, really articular. Yeah, that yeah. Great. Actually, right. it was a great week for rheumato pediatric rheumatologists because uh, tofacitinib got approved two days ago, and then uh, which was the other one? A TNF inhibitor got approved too. I think it was golimumab. Uh, Symphony got approved for uh, poly JIA as well a day later. Okay. So two days ago, tofacitinib got approved, and then golimumab, which is a TNF inhibitor, got approved for JIA. So that means potentially they can also be tried out in JM if, yeah. if you all yes. are yeah. seeing yeah. them. Okay. There's more of a path. Yeah. I don't think we have one genetic diagnosis for JDM. It's considered what we call a polygenic disease or multifactorial. That means we have maybe some genes that contribute to some parts of it. We maybe have some environmental things that contribute to some of it. And then there's this whole unknown as well. So we don't really know what drives it, but in some of our autoimmune diseases, if we can figure out certain genetic associations, it helps drive treatment and also helps us understand the pathophysiology a little bit more. So I think that the simple answer is it's not a one genetic disease. It's not like a, like Duchenne that has one gene and then you inherit it from generation to generation. It's a bunch of different factors that come together to form dermatomyositis, if that makes sense. And right now we don't know what, what those different factors are. So is it genetic in that it's carried down through families or parents or it's not no. that type of genetics? Okay. No, it's not that type of genetics. That's what I wanted to know. My older daughter has a, a genetic problem, but it's not carried down. And so I was not carried down. wondering that about genetics. We do tend to see um, families with autoimmune diseases of a variety having some connection down through the uh, 
um, grandparents, parents, kids. Mm -hmm. And we are doing some research at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in this very line looking mm -hmm. they've taken samples from grandparents parents and kids to see if they can look to find any genetic connections okay thank you mm -hmm. um it looks like we have a question on the chat as well um jim or dr shinoy is there any news from the nih about the research on calcinosis or suzanne yes there is some news. <laughs> I'll let Jim and Dr. Shinoy talk about it. I was gonna say, I can, I can, uh, I can best answer that question um, uh, after October 17th, when we'll, when we'll be hearing a, uh, an update from uh, Adam Schiffenbauer, who is, is directing a calcinosis um, study um, at, uh, at NIH, um, looking at um, sodium thiosulfate um, and its, its ability to um, you know, essentially, essentially disperse um, um, calcium deposits. Um, that study is 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 ongoing. I, I haven't heard any um, uh, any any results, preliminary results from that study, but we will be hearing something um, on our um, uh, new drugs for uh, juvenile myositis uh, medical conference taking place on October seventeenth. So. Um, if, if I could ask your forbearance to, to, to answer that question um, after that time, um, I'll have a more complete answer. I'll just say, um, I have the same news, which is the sodium thiosulfate trial at the NIH. And we did actually use their protocol for one of our kids. And it seemed to work really well, um, but it is quite an onerous drug to use because it's an infusion and it's given three times a week and it's, it's quite cumbersome to use, but if it works well, it may work well. And um, at the NIH, Lisa Ryder and Adam Schiffenbauer have both an IV protocol and then they have a topical one as well. The way that the rest of the day will go is that doc, uh, Dr. Shinoy, Dr. Susan Shinoy, who is the clinical director and I will introduce her in a minute, will talk about labs and what they mean. Uh, then. Courtney Gitney, who is the one of the physical therapists in our clinic, but the primary at the moment, will talk about exercise and JDM. And then Dr. Natalie Rosenwasser will talk about partnering with your practitioner and getting effectively participating in telemed. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susan Shinoy. She's currently the interim clinical chief of pediatric rheumatology at the Rheumatology Division at Seattle Children's Hospital and Research Center and Associate Professor at the University of Washington, Seattle. She's the Center Director of the Myositis Clinic Center of Excellence. Uh-oh, oh, okay, she's screen sharing. And <laughs> along with her research partner, which we also help fund, Dr. Christian Lude at the University of Washington and physical therapist partner, Courtney Gintney. Ginter, oh, I'm sorry, Courtney, I said your name wrong. Uh, Gint. No, inter. <laughs> this center is dedicated to providing excellent clinical care for children with myositis and is made possible by generous funding from the CureJM Foundation. As part of the Myositis Center of Excellence, we have several standardized clinical assessments and research projects that are ongoing. Dr. Shinoy's research interests include epidemiology and environmental research and rheumatological diseases with a focus in arthritis. She, Dr. Shinoy is interested in integration and use of ultrasound in rheumatology and is passionate about increasing awareness and improving outcomes of rheumatological diseases in children. She's a member of CARA, the Childhood Arthritis Rheumatology and Research Alliance, and the Pediatric Rheumatology Collaborative Study Group. Let us welcome Dr. Susan Shinoy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. I have to um, thank the Cure JM uh, Foundation for uh, getting this together. Many thanks to Jim and Suzanne. We hope to see Suzanne soon back in clinic. <laughs> COVID has made things impossible, I feel like it. And many thanks to Shannon as well for getting us all together. Um, so I thought I would quickly go over labs and juvenile dermatomyositis, and we can try and make this interactive. So if people have questions, they can just unmute and ask questions along the way. Um, the key is really that the people that are here get what they want out of it. It's nice to see some familiar faces. And Barb, we met last year at the Cure JM conference. I hope we can get to meet again in person sometime. Um, so I'll dive right in. 
there we go. So my objectives are just to give you a general overview of labs. Um, what do they mean? Why do we measure them? What are the important labs in dermatomyositis? Um, and then I'm kind of going to break it down into some of the standard labs that we do in juvenile dermatomyositis and then some of the less frequent labs that we do in dermatomyositis. So why do we do labs? There's several reasons we may be doing labs. We may do some at diagnosis. We may do some along the course of disease to monitor what, the, what we call disease status is to see if you're flaring or if the kid is in remission. We may do labs to assess severity of disease and that's usually organ involvement. And then we also do labs because a lot of kids with dermatomyositis are on a bunch of medications. And so we do labs for monitoring of the medications. So when you look at the word dermatomyositis, it's split into the derma part or the skin part. And we all know what that includes, which is the heliotrope rash, which comes from the name, the heliotrope flowers, so the purple pink rash on the eyelids, the Gottfried's papules, which is the rash on the hands, sometimes can be seen on the elbows or knees, and the malar rash, which is the rash on the cheeks. We also look at other skin findings that are less common, which I haven't listed here, but there's a whole bunch of skin findings in dermatomyositis, including mechanics hands, holster, holster sign, the shawl sign, which is the rash on the um, chest and the back of the chest. And then you always find us walking around with what I call like our one and only instrument in uh, rheumatology, which is the magnifying glass that is super expensive. But all it does is really it magnifies the blood vessels at the nail beds. And so this is what normal should look like in the nail fold capri. So they are nice, thin, uniform looking blood vessels that supply the nail bed. And then this is what it can look like in children with dermatomyositis or any form of vasculitis really. So you can have areas like this where there's absolutely no blood vessels. So those are called areas of dropout like here. And then you can see all these bushy blood vessels or dilated blood vessels, which just means that they're really thick and they really are a whole bunch of them all together. So there's different medical terms for this like arborization or dilation, um, and those are abnormal. So the skin flare can be independent or with a muscle flare, but there's no real labs to assess skin flare. The way we assess, assess it is with our eyes. So basically we look at the skin, assess the skin, and then we look at the nail fold capillaries. Moving on to the myositis part. So the myo stands for muscle and the itis is inflammation. So whenever you hear us say itis, it just means inflammation of that particular body part. So like hepatitis is liver inflammation, uveitis is eye inflammation, arthritis is joint inflammation. So same way myositis is muscle inflammation and it can be independent or it can be with, with skin flare. In dermatomyositis, it's usually the proximal muscles that are involved. Sometimes the distal muscles are involved. And when I say proximal, I mean the muscles kind of closer up here. So it's usually the shoulders and the upper thigh muscles that are involved. So there's sort of five big labs that we do to assess your muscle status and inflammation in the muscle. So we call these labs as our muscle enzymes. So you'll often hear us tell our nurses, hey, let's get a set of muscle enzymes in this kid, okay? And that is CK, which is creatinine kinase, LDH, standing for lactase dehydrogenase, and aldolase, AST, also known as SGOT, and there's the long names for it, and then ALT or SGPT. The funny part is even though we call them muscle enzymes, they don't always come from the muscle. So I'm gonna go through each one of these in detail because these, this is probably the most common set of labs that your kids get over and over again. So um, the CK, most of the CK really comes from skeletal muscle, right? Which is the organ really that's inflamed in kids with dermatomyositis. There's three actual types of CK. We don't measure the individual ones unless we really need to. In some kids we do, but most often we get a total CK. But if you break down CK, there's three kind of isoenzymes. It's MM, which comes from skeletal muscle, the MB, which comes from the heart, and then the BB, which comes from the brain. And then the um, values of CK are different depending on the age of the child. So you can see after three months, it's mostly somewhere between 20 to 230, okay? 
The LDH also has five isoenzymes, one, two, three, four, and five. And you can see here, it comes from different parts. So LDH1 comes from the heart, from the blood vessels, so the RBCs and the brain. LDH2 comes from the reticular endothelial system, which is another system in your body. Three comes from the lungs, four comes from the kidney, placenta, and pancreas, and five comes from skeletal muscle and liver, okay? Again, the values of LDH are age dependent. So you can see those listed here. The next one is the aldolase, which comes from skeletal muscle, liver, and brain, okay? Again, values are age dependent. And then the last two, which is AST and ALT, are actually predominantly come from the liver. But a part of it comes from skeletal muscle, heart muscle, and other body cells as well. Um, the, of the two, the AST and the ALT, sorry, the AST and the ALT, the AL standing for liver actually predominantly comes from the liver, even more than the AST. And then small amounts come from skeletal muscle, heart muscle, and kidney. So typically, increased levels of these labs usually means that the muscles are inflamed. And that usually suggests active disease or flare in kids with dermatomyositis. However, like I said, it's not only muscle that's driving these labs, right? So other organs can drive these labs. So sometimes we can see kids have elevated AST, ALT level, which like I said, predominantly comes from the liver, but it's not from their myositis. It can be from fatty liver. It can be from steroids, the medicine that they're taking that's driving fatty liver. It can be from hepatitis that they've got for some other reason, okay? Similarly, the LDH is a common one that we see high in kids that are undergoing hemolysis. That means they're breaking down their red blood cells. And LDH, remember I said, also can be seen in the lungs. So sometimes the LDH is high from lung inflammation. So how do we differentiate this? We take the whole clinical picture into account. We're looking at the kid, we're looking at the labs, we're looking at our exam findings, and that's how we decide kind of what is driving these labs. The other caveats with these labs are sometimes you can actually see normal levels and the kid may still be flaring. Like I said, the kid may have a skin flare and not a myositis flare. And that still is considered a flare of their underlying dermatomyositis. Sometimes they can have a muscle flare and their labs are still normal. And we see that often in kids that don't have muscle mass. Sometimes they don't have enough skeletal muscle mass if they're super thin or really cachectic or they've actually had really long-standing disease where their muscles sort of burn out, you can see normal levels and they're still weak. So part of assessment is Courtney here, Courtney Ginter, she does the muscle assessments and we assess clinically whether the kids are weak or not. So again, we take the whole picture into account. Labs cannot be taken in isolation. Sometimes you can see normal levels and the child is weak, not from necessarily active disease and dermatomyositis, but just from having had longstanding disease and they're deconditioned. Or very, very rarely, sometimes we can see steroids itself induce what we call a myopathy, where steroids itself are driving muscle weakness. We've had that in a few kids. And it's, um, it's really important to recognize in those kids that it's the steroids that are driving the muscle weakness rather than active disease. So I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I don't see yet any in the chat. So if you do, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. And um, I don't know, I can't see everybody on the screen at the moment either, so. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. Yeah. All right, so those are sort of our five big muscle enzymes. Okay, those are the ones we will monitor typically every couple months to kind of look for flares and look to see how you're doing. Um, there are other labs that we look for. So the itis part stands for inflammation, remember? And there are two labs that are good for inflammation. Um, one is called the ESR, stands for erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and the other is called the CRP, which is C-reactive protein. While these labs are good for inflammation, they're not great. So any inflammation anywhere in your body can drive these labs. So let's say the kid had arthritis or 
eye disease or uveitis or something like that, that can drive the ESR and CRP up. Let's say the kid had hepatitis or a lung inflammation from something else that can drive the ESR and CRP up. So not just inflammation drives it up, other factors can drive it up. Let's say the kid had a bad pneumonia, um, that can drive the CRP and ESR up. Um, any other infection like a skin infection, a cellulitis, pneumonia, any kind of infection can drive the ESR and CRP up. So it's not very specific for inflammation, but it can be driven up in many things. We also see the ESR and CRP up in kids that are overweight because most kids that are overweight have some form of metabolic syndrome and that can drive the ESR and CRP up. And some of the medications, so IVIG can actually affect the ESR. So we typically don't look at the ESR that much when kids have just received their IVIG because the IVIG is a large molecule that the kids get. And so it can make, um, make the way you test ESR actually abnormal. So a lot of kids will have a high ESR when they're on their IVIG. Okay. Other labs, we routinely will do some more labs for like medication monitoring. A lot of these kids are on steroids and other uh, immunosuppressive medications. So lab medications such as methotrexate, MMF, which is Celsept, azathioprine or Inuran, we typically will check blood counts, kidney function, um, liver function, and sometimes we'll also check immunoglobulin levels after certain kids have received rituximab. But kidney function, liver function, and blood counts are probably the three most common labs we'll do routinely for medication monitoring. And it depends on what medication they're on. So methotrexate, which is probably the most common medicine, we'll do labs every three months. Similarly for MMF and azathioprine. Um, rituximab is sort of a more big gun immunosuppressive medication. So we may be doing labs a little bit more frequently initially. And it can, one of the side effects of rituximab is it can decrease some of the immune function. So it depletes B cells and B cells are responsible for driving IgG. And so we'll monitor IgG levels every couple of months in these kids to make sure they're not getting low. Other tests, so sometimes we'll do MRIs um, to look, and the MRI is really great, particularly this particular sequence called the STIR sequence. It's really great for looking at inflammation in muscles. So remember I said in dermatomyositis, the muscle inflammation is usually in the shoulders and thighs, most commonly in the thighs. So we'll often ask for an MRI of the thighs in some kids where we suspect weakness and their labs are not showing it. We'll sometimes do this at diagnosis and sometimes even in follow-up if we're wondering about what's happening. And the most common things you will see on the MRI store signal. So just to orient you guys, this is kind of at the level of the upper thighs, kind of imagine you've taken a slice and you're looking at the thighs from the top. So that's, that's the whole thigh. And these different blocks here are the different muscle groups in your thigh, okay? And here's the bone. So the muscles are wrapping around the bone. And normally you shouldn't see this bright white signal here. So all this bright white signal that you're seeing in this thigh muscle is actually inflammation. So you can see the myositis itself. Sometimes you'll see edema of the blood vessel, of the muscles. Um, and sometimes you'll see inflammation like here. You can see some inflammation in the underlying skin, the bright white stuff here skin and subcutaneous tissue. So the MRI is quite a useful tool. Some of the caveats of the MRI are for younger kids, they do need to be sedated because it uses a large magnet. And so the kids need to lie relatively still when they're doing this MRI sequences. So some of the younger kids, like kids less than five, I would say, can't really sit still for the MRI. In the older kids, it's a lot easier. Other tests, some kids can have calcinosis. MRI is not great for picking up calcium. It really looks more at muscle and soft tissue. If we want to pick up calcium, we'll do an x-ray like here. So you can see all this. This is the bone. And then um, the light gray is sort of the muscle mass and then the skin. And you can see all these bright white deposits here. That's all calcium deposition within the muscles here of this kid. Um, 
a CT scan is also really good for looking at calcium. And um, Lauren Pachman's group, I think, did kind of whole body CT scans to assess calcium burden because one of the things we struggle with is figuring out whether the calcium is coming or going, is it increasing, decreasing? Sometimes it's really hard to tell that clinically. So you could do a CT scan to assess that. The problem with the CT scan, again, is it's hard to do in younger kids because they need to lie still. And it does involve um, a fair amount of radiation. So it's not a test that I would do very frequently and particularly in young kids. Um, a new and upcoming test is muscle ultrasound. So the ultrasound, you can look at both muscle and you can look at calcium. Um, it's not really been standardized, but it's definitely something that's on the horizon that I think people will start using. Um, it's much more user friendly because we can do the ultrasound in the clinic and uh, you can look at things real time. Um, but it hasn't really been standardized, I would say, in dermatomyositis. It's probably much more standard to use it for arthritis right now, but it's definitely an up-and-coming topic. Other tests. So sometimes you'll see us do muscle antibodies. This is typically a send-out test sent to the Oklahoma Medical Research um, Lab in Oklahoma, and it's usually done at diagnosis or in the initial phase of dermatomyositis. And there's a couple types of antibodies that we look at. So an antibody is a protein molecule that's seen in autoimmune diseases that are not supposed to be there. So we look at MSAs, which stands for myositis-specific antibodies, and then we look at myositis-associated antibodies. Um, so this all of the next few slides are actually from Dr. Ryder's paper. So she's the one that really studied this and really helped classify these kids. Um, so about 63% of dermatomyositis kids can have MSAs or myositis specific antibodies. And then there's a whole different bunch of these. So there's the anti-synthetases, anti-signal recognition particles. Sometimes you'll hear us call it SRP, anti-MI2, anti-P155, anti-MJ. There's about a smaller group of kids that 9% that will have myositis associated antibodies. So those are things such as SSA, SSB, RNPs. And then there's about 30% of kids that are negative for both these antibodies. Okay. So um, in the myositis antibodies, this is sort of the, based on her paper, she did a large retrospective study. This is sort of the split up that we see in kids, so about 32% of Dermatomyositis or overlap kids. Overlap means they have two different autoimmune diseases, such as dermatomyositis and scleroderma or dermatomyositis and lupus. Um, those kids can have P155. About 20% of dermato kids can have an anti-MJ. And then um, the other um, muscle-specific antibodies were seen in 10%. And this is quite different from the adults. The adults have a different um, subset of these present. So what's the significance of this? The best analogy that I could come up with is different flavors to your pizza based on the toppings that you use, right? So think of dermatomyositis at the base of the pizza, and then you add these different toppings. So if you have olives, it tastes different. If you have salami, it tastes different. If you are just a vegetarian, it tastes different, right? So think of dermatomyositis as the underlying disease, and then you have these different sprinklings of autoantibodies. And depending on what autoantibody you have, it gives you a different flavor of the disease. So again, all of this is from Dr. Ryder's paper. So the kids that are P155 positive tend to have more skin stuff. So Godron's papules, malar rash, the shawl sign, photosensitivity, cuticular overgrowth, which is overgrowth around the nail region. They don't tend to have very high CKs and then they, they tend to have a predominantly chronic illness course. Kids that are MJ positive tend to have more muscle cramps, more higher CK levels. They are admitted more often. I'm guessing that's because they have high CK levels and that typically will will be a reason for admission. They can have dysphonia, which means their voice changes because of the pharyngeal weakness or the weakness around the um, voice box. And they tend to have a monocyclic disease course, which means they have that one bad hit of illness, may last a couple years, and then it may never come back again. Antisynthetase, which is actually more commonly seen in adults, it's 
unfortunately not that common in kids. Like I said, it's about 10%, less than 10% of our kids can present with organ involvement. So they can have really bad lung disease and they have mechanics hands. They're typically older at diagnosis. Um, Anti-SRP is more common with juvenile polymyositis, which is sort of a cousin of dermatomyositis, if you want to think of it that way, but without the skin disease. Okay, it's seen, um, it typically has more severe onset. Um, we have very few kids with polymyositis, but it's definitely seen. Um, it's more common in adults, I would say. They can have high CK levels, they have frequent hospitalization, they have a chronic disease course, and often tend to use wheelchairs during the initial diagnosis. Anti-MI2 antibodies are more common in the Hispanic population. They present like classic dermatomyositis with malar rashes and high CK levels, and they typically have a very good prognosis. Um, and then the kids, the 30% of kids that have no antibodies typically will have other skin signs like the linear erythema, joint pain, and again, monocyclic disease course, okay? So I'll stop there to see if there's any other questions. Yeah, on There those. are a couple of questions. Okay. So one of the questions was, um, does the increase in calcium indicate a remission? Um, great question. We don't know. So traditionally, I will tell you what we, I was taught with this disease is that as calcium is depositing, it usually means that that's worsening disease. It's a sign of active disease. As I've been doing this more, I will tell you that we know so little about why calcinosis occurs and what drives it that I don't really think we understand that part of the disease at all. Yeah. Um, so it's a really hard question to answer. I can tell you based off my clinical practice, we've had a bunch of kids with really bad calcinosis and a bunch of kids that have a little bit of calcium and then it goes away. And don't ask me why it does that in some and why it does it in the others because we tend to treat kids the same way and yet in some it just seems to have this smoldering course and in others it melts away after a few years. In general, however, I would say that if I'm seeing increase in calcium, I don't like it. To me, that's a sign of active disease. And what about the percentage of JM kids that come down with lupus? Oh, I don't know how many would have overlap. I would say a smaller proportion, probably less than 20 or 30%. I don't have the exact numbers, but it's a very small portion. And those are the kids we'll call overlap. And typically in those kids, it's kind of which organ systems are involved that will drive the treatment. There are just too few of them to study. Yeah, I would say exactly. The, Dr. Rosenwasser says there's too few of them to really study individually because like you're talking about a rare disease and then you're talking about an even rarer subset in that rare disease. Uh, and if I could jump in, I don't know if I'm off mute, but um, Joan, I posted in the chat. If you go to curejm.org slash book, you can get a 500 page book and they have a whole chapter on um, answering some of your different questions. So that would be um, a lot of information. There's a whole chapter on overlap and some of the other things. So I'll, I posted that link in the um, chat and I'll email it afterwards. And, and I just wanna add that um, a lot of the research is changing. And so that book is over 10 years old at this point. <laughs> And so I would recommend going onto the CureJM website and looking under the link for uh, research because we have posted probably 30 or 40 different research studies that have, you know, that we've participated in, we've added to, we've supported, et cetera. And so I think you can see some of what's going on there. I would also like, Susan, just to mention, if you could, um, what Dr. Lude's work in calcinosis might be. Oh my God, I don't think I'm equipped to do it, but he looks at um, NETS, which is neutrophil extraction molecules. And he's looking also at like mitochondria um, that may be driving the calcinosis. I'm really not very well equipped to, he, he's doing very elegant and uh, fantastic research, looking at what could be driving calcinosis. And those, those are the two big things that he's looking at as kind of things that might be driving it, which is mitochondrial stuff and nets. Yeah. So if anyone has more you know, questions about that, again, look at our website 
and I will let you go on because I don't Great. think we have any more questions at this point. Okay. So some tests, like we said, will do to assess disease severity. This is usually at the start of disease, but sometimes along the course of the disease, if we think the kids are flaring really badly. Um, so we'll do a swallow study to check for weakness of the muscles in the neck region or the uh, swallowing uh, pipe, which is the esophageal region. Um, we'll do for lung study. We may check lung studies. So either PFTs, which are lung function tests or a CT of the lung particularly if they're worried about lung disease. And sometimes we'll do an echocardiogram to assess the state of the heart in the myositis. Things that I would say that we rarely use are things like muscle or skin biopsy. Um, I've seen kids come to me with skin biopsies. It's not something that I typically order. They usually have them in the community because somebody's seen the rash and then they biopsy it and it comes back as dermatomyositis. Um, so that's where I've seen skin biopsies. I, we don't tend to do skin biopsies because we're well versed at recognizing some of the skin signs in dermatomyositis. We have used muscle biopsies where very, very rarely, particularly in kids that we are not completely sure that they have a particular diagnosis. Um, and so the skin biopsy is fairly simple procedure. It's just a punch biopsy of the skin, but the muscle biopsy is a little bit more invasive. And that's one of the reasons we don't do it. So they have, the kids have to be sedated. We have a surgeon go in and then take a little piece of the thigh muscle out and then um, have our pathologist examine it under the microscope. So there's certain characteristic features that we see that tell us that this is dermatomyositis. Very rarely, we can also do muscle biopsies if we're wondering if the kid has steroid myopathy and there's certain features that are very classically see seen on this uh, muscle biopsy and steroid myopathy. There's atrophy of a certain type of muscle fiber and you can tell that very easily on a, on a muscle biopsy. I have never used this test. It still exists in the textbooks. Um, it's called an EMG. So it's very invasive, particularly for our kids. We don't want to do this. We really much prefer doing MRIs. I have seen some kids come to us, sadly, with this done outside. They basically poke a bunch of needles into different muscles and they attach all these electrodes on and then they look at um, they give the muscles certain stimuli and then they look at how the muscles are uh, kind of responding to those stimuli. And again, there's very characteristic patterns that you see in myositis and that's, it was used in the good old days. Fortunately, we're in the 20th century. We don't have to use it anymore, I would say. So to quickly summarize, I would say each child is unique. It really depends on what stage of their disease they're in. Um, there is not one diagnostic test for dermatomyositis. A single lab that's elevated is really not important to me. We look for trends over time. If, if your labs are going up, that's typically a bad sign. If your labs are kind of, if you started out with a CK of 20,000 and now your CK is 500, that's usually a good thing. Um, we take all labs and the clinical assessment into account. So Labs are just one piece of the puzzle or one slice of that pizza, if you want to go back to the pizza analogy. There are many different aspects to it. And so labs are just that one slice. And so you really want to take the clinical assessment, the muscle assessment, and everything else into account when you do these. Um, and that was it. So uh, I did want to try, I forgot to put here my acknowledgement slide, so I apologize, but I really wanted to acknowledge um, some of my partners in this work, which is Courtney Ginter, our fabulous uh, physical therapist in the clinic, and Dr. Rosenwasser, who helps see a lot, a lot of these patients. Uh, and last but not least, um, the CureGM Foundation. We miss Suzanne terribly in clinic. I hope she can come back soon. Uh, like this slide says, I really don't mind coming into work. Um, and uh, thank you to Shannon and Jim and Andrew and everybody from the Pure GM Foundation that um, allows us to do this work. It's great to be a part of this. Questions, any other questions? Oh, Suzanne, you're on mute. Suzanne, you're on mute. I got it, I got it. Um, so after a JM diagnosis, how long does the patient usually continue having blood tests? Um, I would say we tend to do blood tests because most JM kids are on medications for a long period of time. 
So we tend to do blood tests at least periodically. Initially, it may be more frequent after diagnosis, but um, when they get to a state of what we call remission on medications, you'll probably be having blood tests every three or four months only. And then we do have, knock on wood, some kids that have gone into remission off medications. And I don't do blood tests on those kids unless they are flaring or I'm worried about them. We just go by clinical um, findings. In my experience with a child who's been in remission for six years, uh, after she was off meds, there was like every three to four months, then it was, went to six months, and then maybe once a year, and now we don't even do them. So um, yeah. it's a tapering in my experience, but yeah. maybe that's different. Yeah. Nope, that's right. I would say we taper it because usually we're, I think we're worried in the initial phase after they go off meds to make sure that they're not flaring. Um, so initially it'll be more frequent and then it tapers off. and. I see some kids now annually, and it's great seeing them like that. So hopefully all kids can get to that phase. Thank you, Dr. Shinoy. That was terrific. If people have more questions, please put them in the chat. We're going to move on. Okay. And I am going to try to say Courtney's name correctly. <laughs> Ginter. <laughs> Courtney is a licensed physical therapist who received her Bachelor of Science degree in psychology with a minor in special education and rehab rehabilitation at the University of Arizona in 2012. She completed her doctorate in physical therapy at Northern Arizona University in 2016. And Courtney joined the Seattle Children's Hospital team in January of 2019 and began working in the Myositis Center for Excellence shortly afterwards. Uh, yay, Courtney. Courtney has nearly five years of clinical experience working with clients of all ages and backgrounds. And in her free time, she enjoys traveling, spending time gardening, and volunteering at the local animal shelter. So Courtney, welcome. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, being a part of the myositis team at Seattle Children's is one, one of the most fun things that I get to do um, in my job. And I'm really excited to see some familiar faces and to do this presentation. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about exercise and juvenile myositis. Um, so before we begin, I have no conflicts of interest with this presentation. Um, what I'm going to do today is kind of talk about my role in the Myositis Center for Excellence, um, describe the tests that I do, and kind of what physical therapy does in general. Um, I'm also going to provide some recommendations and considerations for exercise in children with juvenile dermatomyositis and hopefully answer some of the questions you guys have. Um, so as the physical therapist, when you come into the clinic, I'm going to be performing two standardized measures that are specific to JM. And so that's the CMAS and the MMT8. I'm also going to be assessing function and just your child's ability to participate with their friends and do the things that they like to do. We're screening for other impairments or risk factors, um, anything that might indicate a need for PT or a need for other referrals. Um, and then I'll hopefully make some recommendations that are specific to either a home program, keep doing what you're doing, or hey, we might need to try physical therapy for you. Um, so more specifically, I'm looking at endurance. So is your kid keeping up with their friends? Are they having difficulty sitting while they're you know, at school or virtual on the computer this year? Um, are they having difficulty walking around the block with family or difficulty when you're going to the grocery store um, that's abnormal or different from what they used to be? Um, we're looking at muscle weakness specifically. So like Dr. Shinoy said, it's usually those proximal muscles, so closer to the trunk, closer to the body that are weak and affected in these kids. And we see that by um, some difficulty with sitting up from a lying down position, um, maybe difficulty with stairs, difficulty getting up off the floor. Um, and we can see that sometimes on one side more so than the other side. So screening for that. Um, and then monitoring for any joint tightness, range of motion restrictions, and then pain. So my goal as a physical therapist is to minimize any impairments that I find. So we're supporting your child to be independent with their mobility and being able to participate and be functional um, in school, with family, with friends. And then this is kind of a, you know, it's a long-term goal, right? So we want our kiddos to be healthy for years and years to come. And so 
meeting physical activity recommendations is one of the big ways that we do that. So the first test that we do um, that was developed originally is called the CMAS. And so that is the Childhood Myositis Assessment Scale. And that is a 14 test item test. Um, it includes three time tests that are endurance based and um, has a total score of 52. So the higher the number, the more functional, the stronger your kiddo is. Um, this was first validated specific for kids with juvenile myositis in 1999 um, and has been found to be to correspond pretty well with some of the other things that the physicians are looking at in strength and function. Um, and so what this looks at is both muscle strength, muscle endurance, and then we're really looking at the pattern of how they're doing these movements. So like I said, when the uh, more proximal muscles are affected, it impacts how our child's moving. So getting off the floor, sitting up from lying, and we're looking for compensatory techniques. So our kids are really resilient and they learn ways to figure out how to do it, but there's ways that they're doing it that you can see that it, it's harder than um, it should be. It might be a little bit atypical. So there's also um, the CMAS that we do in clinic is the full 14 item test out of 52, but there's also a abbreviated version called the CMAS 9, um, and that has a total of 37. And so apologies for how blurry this graph is, it was a copy and paste, but you can see that they're really just taking out some of the um, sort of redundant tests, right? So if I can lift my leg and hold it, you don't need to score the fact that they lifted it in the first place. Um, and this test is going to become important when we talk about norms, normative values. So in 2004, they did a study looking at kids without any muscle disease, and they took them through the um, CMAS 9. And so here's a little bit more of a clear chart for you. Up through the age of nine, even typical kids are not expected to get full points. And that's just because some of these test items are really hard. Um, I always kind of preface the kids before we start that the first test, that head hold, is the hardest one and it's super uncomfortable. So even when I try and lie flat on my back, lift my head up and hold it for two minutes, which they want you to do, it's not fun. Um, so up until age nine, even if your kiddo doesn't have that full score, it doesn't necessarily mean a flare or a problem. Um, so like Dr. Shinoy said, we have to look at the whole picture. And as a physical therapist, we start adding on other tests. So um, the manual muscle test eight was validated in 2010, and that looks at eight specific muscles that are most impacted by the disease. And so we test them on the right side and the left side, plus the neck flexors are tested, and it's scored on a scale of zero to 10. The total score for all of the items is 150 points. And so again, a higher score typically means higher function, better endurance. Um, and so this test was found to correlate well with the other outcomes used, the MRI findings, the CMAS, um, and is also found they liked it because it was easy to do. And so even if you do have calcinosis or range of motion restrictions, the positions are easy to get into. And eight also felt like a really good, sensitive, accurate number. So like I mentioned, our kiddos are really resilient and find really good ways to compensate for any muscle weakness. So in our clinic, we also look at a few other tests. So we do a timed test, a single leg hop to look at one side versus the other, and then a two-footed jump. Um, we're gonna be looking at adding up the timed up and go test, which was recently shown to correlate a little bit better with endurance and that cardiovascular aerobic capacity. So I'll kind of pause there um, in case there's any questions about my role or the role of PT in the clinic. Okay, I will keep going then. So let's talk about exercise and physical activity. So the CDC has recommendations for children um, and they kind of break them up into age groups. So for preschool age groups, they should be active for most of the day and any activity counts as exercise. And so for our preschool age kids, this is usually not hard to do. Um, they're usually meeting these requirements pretty easily. Once we get to our grade school age kids and teenagers, that becomes a lot more challenging to just naturally meet. And especially this year going into um, 
a largely virtual school environment, meeting these expectations and these requirements is getting harder and harder. So what the CDC does recommend is that every single day we have we are physically active for 60 minutes or more. And so that can be broken up into little bits and that doesn't necessarily mean exercise. They do, however, want exercise three days a week for about 60 minutes um, and at a moderate to vigorous intensity. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So exercise versus physical activity. Physical activity is described as any bodily movement produced by the contraction of skeletal muscle that increases en energy expenditure above a basal level, or more simply, it's just movement. So getting up off the couch, getting away from the screen, just moving. Uh, exercise is a little bit more structured, a little bit more repetitive, geared at either specific goals or changes and at an intensity where your body's changing, your heart rate's changing, your metabolism's being impacted, um, that kind of thing. And there are three different kinds that have been recommended, all of which should be included in your child's typical routine. So uh, the first type of exercise is aerobic exercise. So that term comes from a word meaning with oxygen, and that is that cardio respiratory fitness. So you're getting your heart rate up, you're getting your breathing rate up, and you're sustaining that. Um, and so this should encompass most of the child's activity. Um, examples of this are walking, running, bike riding, rollerblading. So anything that's just kind of getting that heart rate and breathing rate up. Muscle strengthening is another exercise type. So this is anything that's kind of putting extra force on the muscles more than what they're used to. Um, so if you're looking at the research, they'll often talk about a one RM or one repetition maximum. And so that's kind of how to gauge the amount of strength, the amount of force. And so one RM is what you call um, if something you're able, a weight you're able to lift one time, but not two times. Um, and so examples of muscle strengthening is climbing trees, climbing jungle gyms, tug of war. It's weight training for our older kids, um, building forts. It could be chores, heavy work, anything like that. So bone strengthening is the third kind of exercise that's recommended. And so this is similar to muscle strengthening in that you're putting abnormal forces on the bones than you would normally do at rest. This is most commonly done through impact with the ground. So jumping, quick changes in movement, that kind of thing. Oftentimes, and there's more studies going into this, the muscle strengthening exercises can also be bone strengthening exercises. So especially for um, resistance training and weights, we see some of those same changes. So there's a lot of overlap in these types of exercises and the goals that you're getting. So you don't necessarily need to find three different exercises to do each time you're exercising. So examples of this include tennis, hopscotch, jump rope, um, and running. So what about flexibility? I remember growing up in school, they were always talking about flexibility and stretching, um, but unfortunately the research is unclear as to what the benefits of stretching and flexibility are alone and independently. Um, definitely it's good to be flexible if your certain sport or exercise that you like to do requires it. So dancing, gymnastics, hurdle jumping, um, you need to be flexible for that so you can avoid injury. Um, you should also address it if you're having deficits. So some of our kids do get tightness, especially, you know, teenage boys will always have hamstring tightness. Um, uh, oftentimes our calf muscles can get tight, especially if we're sitting a lot. Um, hip flexors can get tight. So being able to, you know, stretch and keep yourself nice and loose and within normal limits will also help prevent an injury. Um, and it's definitely good. Sometimes stretching just feels good. And so if that's the case, go ahead and do it. Okay, so we talked about what kinds of exercises a little bit. Let's talk about that moderate to vigorous piece. Um, and so on a scale of one to 10, so the moderate to vigorous is the intensity. So that's really how hard is it? How high is your heart rate? How much are you breathing? Um, and so the goal on here, if you look at the scale of zero to 10 is anywhere between a four and an eight. So if you're, if you're not quite getting up to that four, then you might not be getting some of the benefits and the physiological changes that I'll talk about in a little bit. If you're going overboard, again, we're talking about kind of lifestyle changes, right? And so if you're working out so, so hard that you're in this 
gasping for air category in number 10, you're not going to want to do it again. You're, especially the kiddos, they are going to fight you if it's that uncomfortable. So a four to eight. Um, and so a four, you think about that is you're able to talk, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but you're not able to sing a song or hold that tune, right? Um, and then an eight will be all the way up to, we're not having a conversation. You can get a few words out here and there, but it's going to be difficult. So examples of moderate and vigorous exercise, again, depending on how you do it, really any exercise could be anywhere between those. So um, hiking versus running up the stairs, you know, walking versus sprinting, dancing, like slow versus dancing fast, um, that kind of thing. So it just, it could be anything. It just depends on how you're doing it. Okay. So more specifically for exercise in our kids with juvenile dermatomyositis or polymyositis, the first thing to know is exercise is safe. Um, so it's been shown in the research to be really well tolerated both in inactive and active cases of disease. It has not been shown to instigate a flare and through most of the research, the only side effects seen are mild muscle soreness. And this is something that any population who starts exercising, starts a new exercise, um, changes the intensity of what they're doing, will probably get muscle soreness. Um, and we'll mention, we'll talk about this a little bit later on as well. Um, so the other benefit is that it's therapeutic. Um, so some of the, the findings in research have been that exercise may help to reduce disease activity and be anti-inflammatory in nature. Um, exercise is shown to kind of improve that long-term physical function and well-being, um, and it reduces stress and kind of improves that mental health aspect um, that we talked about a little bit. So there is a study in 2016 that took 15 patients with established myositis, and they put them in a um, aerobic training exercise where they did a little bit of endurance-based resistance training, bike riding, they did this three times a week for a total of 60 minutes. So what I'd like to call out, first of all, is that this study just took the regular exercise recommendations from the CDC and applied that to our kiddos with disease. And so what they found, all sorts of good things. So mitochondrial biogenesis, cytoskeletal remodeling, muscle hypertrophy, capillary growth, and protein synthesis. And they also found a down regulation in the immune response, stress, and inflammation, inflammatory genes. So yay, all good things. Um, another study looked at both aerobic and resistance training, again, meeting those guidelines of an hour, a day, an hour per day, three days a week um, of exercise, and also found a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines, so that signaling response of inflammation. Um, for long-term, we know that kids with JM are at risk for long-term physical impairments. Um, and one study did find that longer disease duration was correlated with lower uh, levels of moderate to vigorous activity. But what you'll see in one of the next studies I talk about is that our kiddos are capable of making changes and are capable of improving with exercise. Um, so in 2019, um, they looked at people with active disease, inactive disease, and then normal healthy controls. And so um, both of the JM groups were seen to have lower aerobic capacity, so that endurance aspect. Um, but there was a subset in the inactive disease group who were meeting the physical recommendation guidelines, and they were able to perform almost identically to their healthy peers, so people with not without disease. So um, that exercise can definitely make an impact and help improve our kids' function long-term. Yet another study looked at the comparison of exercise prescribed with medication um, compared to medication prescribed alone and found improved physical function two years later. Um, so again, just reinforcing that better, um, we are able to recover, we're able to make an improvement um, with exercise and that that'll help us function, stay healthy, and feel good later on down the road. Um, and so finally, exercise and physical activity has been found in many populations to reduce stress and improve mental health. And we know that kids growing up with chronic health conditions often have a lot of issues with anxiety and just other mental health concerns. So physical activity is one really powerful tool in combating that. 
Um, and it has been shown even in our younger kids, if you start that physical exercise and implement that into their daily life early on, that they're able to be more resilient against that um, mental health impact later on as they grow. So just kind of in summary, um, you know, recovery doesn't happen spontaneously, but it is possible. And so by incorporating exercise into your daily life, we can see kiddos who potentially have minimized disease and who have improved long-term function. So getting started, we do want to, um, I do want to highlight some precautions. So a lot of them are associated with kind of the secondary impacts of the disease. And so the first one is steroids. And steroids um, have been shown to co cause fragility in the bones. So if you have a child who's on a lot of steroids or has been on steroids for a long time, we wanna make sure that they maybe start exercising with lower impact activities to reduce that risk for fracture. Um, sometimes we'll see joint tightness or joint restrictions like I talked about earlier. Um, and that can cause a higher risk for injury just by altering kind of those biomechanics. So you can get like a tendonitis or just kind of abnormal muscle soreness um, by doing something a little, you know, abnormally. Um, and then, you know, we talked about some overlap cases. So sometimes there is arthritis or joint pain that we can see. Um, and if that's the case, there's other considerations to take into as well. And typically we recommend lower impact activities for that as well. Um, but exercise is still important. And so there are, regardless of what's going on, there are typically ways to work around the exercise. And that's what a physical therapist is for. So um, if we are identifying any of these other kind of precautions or yellow flags, um, physical therapy can help modify exercises to make sure that your child is still able to meet those goals and to still receive the benefits of exercise. Okay. So like I said, we are, our goal is to build a healthy, active lifestyle. So um, this is something we want to implement long-term. So starting off slow is going to be really important. So starting off with a shorter burst of exercise, 10 to 15 minutes at a time, um, and then building up as you're able to. Um, a reminder that that mild muscle soreness, if you're new to exercise or your child is new to exercise, is normal. Um, and is safe and it should go away within two to three days. Abnormal would be any sort of soreness that's limiting your energy, limiting mobility, ability to walk, if it's, um, and if it's limiting you for a couple of days or longer than that two or three days, right? So it should be, it's normal if it's minimal, but if it's really causing an impact, then that's maybe not normal. So examples of low impact activity, um, if you are having, you know, any joint pain, or if we have a kiddo who is on maybe longer term steroids and we're concerned about their bone strength, include um, all of these. Um, so really, we're just avoiding, you know, running as a higher impact, um, any impactful sports that involve maybe tackling or anything like that. Um, and then anything with jumping as well. So lots of different options. These are not the only options. Um, some ideas there. Another increasingly popular type of exercise, especially in chronic health conditions like cystic fibrosis, is HIIT training. So high intensity interval training. And this sounds super intimidating at first, but it's actually becoming more popular because it's really actually well tolerated with kids. And so a typical HIIT session in, involves a warm up, and then you'll have a series of exercises um, squats, jumping jacks, push ups. Um, and so you'll start with one exercise, you'll do as many as you can in that moderate to vigorous, you know, intensity range for 30 seconds, and then you rest, and you get a break. And then you go through the next exercise. And so you and you can recover, um, repeat it four to six times. And all of a sudden, you have your 15, 20 minute long exercise. It's meeting your guidelines, but you really only worked hard and been uncomfortable for three minutes. So um, this is, it's easy to do, it's well tolerated. It can be done at home without a lot of equipment um, and you still get all the benefits of exercise that we discussed previously. Courtney, can I stop you for one second or are you on your wind down? I'm on my wind down, but I'm happy to 
stop as well. <laughs> so there are a couple of questions, so they may it may help as we're winding down too. So one of the questions is, um, does one need to be in remission to go back to gymnastics? Um, not necessarily. Um, there's a couple of different considerations. So especially now that we're really conscious about how um, we are spreading germs, um, thinking about what medications you're on, even if you're, um, if you're not in remission, that would make you maybe immunosuppressed. Um, and then just looking at what does that gymnastics exercise involve, right? Are we going to, maybe we shouldn't start with all of the tricks right away. Um, there's a certain level of conditioning that's required to actually start competing. Um, but a lot of times coaches are pretty flexible. And again, you can use PT to help guide some specific concerns for that, depending on what level the child's at. Um, but you don't need to be in remission to start that conditioning program to get back to doing what you're doing. Um, Probably high levels of steroids not recommended. Potentially, potentially. Okay, and then one more question. Uh, what are the signs of bone weakness? So I would say as a physical therapist, there are not necessarily clinical signs of bone weakness. Um, there is a lot of the history that we take that would make us suspicious of bone weakness, such as um, if anyone has been severely weak and not walking, then we would think that that might play a role. Medications that they're on may play a role. Um, history of fractures um, and stress fractures would also maybe make us think that those bones are softer um, or at risk for breaking. Um, and then we would turn to our physician friends who would order some x-rays, potentially maybe do a DEXA scan to actually take a look at that um, and refer to the team to indicate whether that's the case or not. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So winding down, children with JM are encouraged to start exercising as soon as possible, but there is no one size fits all solution. Um, and so again, like we kind of mentioned just now, you will wanna check in with your child's healthcare provider team for specific concerns, specific precautions. Um, and that physical therapists, are, we're available to help and we're able to help think of modifications, think of other ways to get active and help build you, um, support you as you build that healthy lifestyle. Got some references. Any other questions? Yeah, you can put yourselves off mute if you have a question. Uh, not seeing any at the moment. And if something comes up, please put it in the chat. Anything else that you want to add, Courtney, before I give everybody a break? Okay, let's take Dr. Shinoi would like me to add that a lot of times she's prescribing calcium and vitamin D to help kind of combat that um, bone weakness with the steroid. So a lot of times your providers are kind of already on top of that um, and that some of those supplements do help. Um, so that is, we're kind of on top of that already. <laughs> and I will also add that we are funding a research project in Toronto with Dr. Brian Feldman looking at exercise and various supplements as well. So there's a lot of research going on about exercise and fatigue and strengthening. So it's all great. Um, we even have I, Dr. Shinoya ultrasound. We did some research on, with Laura Tassin. So that might be something that we can talk further about. Anything else? Okay, let's take a five minute break. I'd love to see everybody back here as soon as you can. And um, I'm going to hang out here. So if you have questions, you can unmute yourself, talk to me, talk to Shannon.
Is Connie getting her on? Because she might be related to Marnie, her. you're on uh, mute if you're talking to us. She's off mute. There you go. I, I heard, I saw your lips moving. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, here you are. Hey. <laughs> How's PA? You guys have any smoke? Hey. Actually, we're really foggy. It's pretty foggy here too. Yeah, so is Redmond. True fog. I think ours though is a little bit of smoke because we just went around the block and you I could, could smell it. Yeah, I could kind of feel it was a little smoke. Where are you from? We're all in mostly in Seattle. Ah. Okay. Yeah. We're the Northwest. The Pacific yeah. Northwest. On chapter. Thursday we had smoke, but not today. I don't think we have any today. We had a we actually had a couple of days that we were told it was smoke, everything was overclouded. And we were told it was from the fires out there. Didn't work. Actually, during the uh, dust bowl, they had some of the dust storms, there were two that were so strong that they had dust on ships, a couple of ships in the Atlantic Ocean from a couple of those dust storms in the middle, Oklahoma, that area, panhandle of Texas. We are all connected. Mm-hmm. Hi, Simonetta. Nice to see you. Barbara, I just, I've been here the whole time. I just turned it off because you don't want to hear dogs barking or yeah. everybody coming in. <laughs> also, just keeping in mind for the recording, um, it will jump to any noise, so it's good to oh, yeah. um, not have it jump to your screen. Keep it on the doctors. Yeah. We can probably fix that when we edit it, but we'll see. Makes Barbara, sense. where are you located? I'm in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, okay. Mm. And, and we got some of your smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Well, I don't know if it's ours. I, I like to blame Oregon. Chrissy's on here from Oregon. Aww. Oregon, how's that, California. How's everybody doing? Um, our children or us? <laughs> I mean, our grandchildren. It's, uh, we'll start with you. We'll start with you. I'm doing or your fine. family. Uh, I'm doing fine. Morgan is down to uh seven and a half milligrams of steroids which we are delighted she still can't mm -hmm. go well nobody can leave the house they're very yeah. clear that everybody stays home fortunately both her parents can work from home yeah do they so have stairs in their house they do they have stairs she has no problem going good. up and down the That's good. I was going to say she could use that for exercise too. Right. In fact, I'm going, I'm going to take the exercise part of this, of this program and insist that her mother watch it. Mm. Her, her well, mother hasn't been real strong on the exercise part of it. It's so hard because everything mean is, is happening all at once. You know, the virtual learning, the everyday stuff. You know, regular yeah. health, uh, <laughs> health, you know, or issues and matters that need attention with JM, you know, the pandemic. It's just like all these layers. And there are a lot of great online programs too for exercise, for a yoga. Uh, I know I've been doing some, and I know there's, you know, like mat classes for Ooh. Pilates online. And that's nice. Yeah. I see Pamela now. Hi, Pamela. Yeah. I think she hears you. Hopefully. Good to see you. I saw a smile. Yeah, <laughs> I see a wave. It's great right, to see the new faces. I'm going to wait a couple more minutes before we start up with Dr. Rosenwasser. So I didn't mean to put a long list of negative things. There's like positive things too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like start listing all the positive too. So, so let's see. Uh, 
going back. On. Was there Jay's back? Good. I, I'm assuming the rest of everybody has been have been listening in and not on camera. So I think we'll go ahead and start. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Natalie Rosenwasser. She's an assistant professor of rheumatology who joined the Seattle Children's Division of Pediatric Rheumatology in 2019. She trained at the Hospital for Special Surgery and New York Presbyterian Cornell campus for her fellowship. She's very interested in autoimmune connective tissue diseases within the field of pediatric rheumatology. She's actively involved in CARA, the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Association. She loves teaching medical students, residents, and fellows, and she's passionate about providing children and their families with high quality care long-term and creating an environment with shared decision-making she feels is central to that care. She's the Director of Quality Improvement at Seattle Children's and able to work, and she's really able to work on that mission. She's also part of the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which helps children and their families obtain a diagnosis when their clinical picture is obscure or unknown at the moment. So Dr. Rosenwasser, take it away. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and thank you so much for everyone for coming to this wonderful event, and thanks CureJM for having me. Today, we'll be talking about telemedicine in children with juvenile dermatomyositis. It's a timely discussion, especially here at Seattle Children's Hospital, where we've been able to implement telemedicine almost seamlessly into our division for our children. The objective today is to provide an overview of the telemedicine process at Seattle Children's Hospital, the risks and benefits of telemedicine, optimal experience using telemedicine, and an overview of the physical exam, which Courtney has so nicely demonstrated for us. So what is telemedicine? It's providing medical services from a distance. There are two types. One is synchronous, where we have a live video conferencing, sort of like what we have now which is a two-way audiovisual link between typically the patient and the provider. And it's almost comparable to an in-person um, outcome in, in certain fields like psychiatry. So it's not always the perfect uh, modality, but it's pretty good. It allows us to have some timely care and there's no need to travel. So lots of families like this option. Asynchronous telemedicine is where people can store and forward the video conferencing and so this is typically forwarded to a provider. So it's not in real time. It's good for specialty care in areas where certain specialists are not available. Again, allows for parents and families to be present to access care and there's no need for travel. And it can overcome some language and cultural barriers. Well, how do we do this? So during your visit, your provider will determine whether you are eligible. This takes into account many, many different things. It can take into account your disease, where you live, um, access to um, telemedicine, especially if you have um, great internet or video services that will make the, the, the visit fruitful. So scheduling will call you to coordinate a visit with you if you are eligible. You must be seen once a year in person in clinic, and that's part of our standardized process here at Seattle Children's. You must have the tools and the internet capability like I described. And if you're flaring, this is not the most optimal way to be seen and evaluated. Um, sometimes we need children to get admitted or to have certain medications that may be time sensitive. So if you're flaring or you think you're flaring, give us a call and we may need to see you in person sooner. From a legal standpoint, this is important, we can only deliver services in states where we are licensed. So if you are going on vacation to Hawaii, make sure you are not going to be um, in that state during the visit because we unfortunately will not be able to deliver that care to you. Currently, the platform we're using is Zoom. So it's important that you have your Zoom application downloaded to whatever electronic device you are using. And it's important that your camera is working and not broken prior to the visit, so make sure. And it's also important that you are able to access the app before the visit. When is it not going to be the best experience? Like I mentioned, it's not great if you're flaring. So if your child is having difficulty breathing, voice changes, is choking on food, 
or is unable to walk, we really need to be seeing your child in person sooner rather than later. Other situations where evaluation is difficult, if your internet access is unreliable, if the video quality is not great, if the lighting is not great, and if we don't have a space to complete a focused exam. Also, if the ch child is not available, it can make for a less than ideal situation. Um, if the child is young, you can have some toys and other coloring books or distractors to help keep the child occupied. So some good housekeeping rules, be at home and set inside where privacy can be maintained, not in a car or outside, preferably. I've had visits in cars, which are not optimal. Be in a quiet place, isolated from pets and other distractors, although I love seeing cats and dogs, they can certainly interfere in the exam portion. Have a pen and paper handy and medications easily available. And if you have a diary of symptoms, we'd love for you to have that available to us as well. This is really important. If your labs are due um, and you want us to review them prior to the appointment, call us and let us know. We'll send you an offsite lab slip that can be completed closer to home or at Seattle Children's if that's close to you as well. And that way we can have all of the information or as much of the information as we need prior to the appointment or at the appointment so that we can make educated decisions about next steps. And of course, like I mentioned, children should be around and available if possible. Um, another important thing to consider is that the child should be wearing clothes where your joints or other common areas where skin rashes can be present are easily visible. So the face, of course, um, any of the joints and the hands and the wrists, elbows, um, you can certainly have the calcium deposits on the back of the elbow. So it's really great if you, you're wearing short, short sleeve shirt or other um, clothing that allows for that. You can have something that Dr. Shinoid mentioned, the holster sign, which can be rashes over the thighs. So if you are having rashes over the thighs, it's great to be able to visualize them. Um, you wanna be able to look at your knees and other areas of your body that you could have rashes or flaring joints. Um, you wanna have a step stool if available, since we were going to try to do a modified joint and muscle exam, uh, which can be difficult and challenging at home, but we try our best. So if you are in the myositis clinic, you may have a little bit of a, a longer time period to complete a fuller muscle exam, but the step stool can certainly be helpful to have. Um, and if you have a yoga mat or a towel so the child can lay down and show us some of their muscles, muscle strength, that would be great as well. Um, we also like to assess the child's gait. So we like to have a cleared path for children to walk back and forth on and so we can assess whether they are walking properly or have any other um, con muscular concerns. Some other do's and don'ts, have a stabilized camera. This can be elevated on three to four books. Um, if you're using a cell phone camera, have a holder or a stand or a cup or you can lay it against a book. You need both hands to be free. Part of it is for writing, part of it can be to help examine the child. Many reasons we need our hands to be free. And make sure you have good lighting and the sun is not causing a glare because that can make things pretty challenging. If there's an area of concern, have the area ready to show. So if you have any new redness, warmth, lumps, bumps, or difficulty moving, we'd love to see it. And take photos of the rashes and any ulcers that you may visualize. It's often difficult to tell over telemedicine what these rashes look like. So we say take pictures at multiple angles, close up, back far, and send them to us a couple of days. If you send them to us at least two days before the clinic, we can make sure that we have them available and we can take a look at them before and see if there are any concerns, more urgent concerns. And most importantly, be verbal about what hurts and we encourage children to be more vocal and encourage them to participate in the visit because if you're not telling us or if they're not telling us what hurts, we really can't help them and that makes things really challenging. Additional thoughts, um, we want to make sure that noise levels are kept to a minimum. They can be distracting. Keep an eye on siblings that may, may like to uh, steal the spotlight from their siblings and pets, which again, I enjoy, but can um, interfere with the exam. The advantages of telemedicine is that they can decrease the cost of the visit and they decrease the time more so for the families overall. It's of course convenient and so families appreciate that convenience. It can 
also be a great option if you're living remotely or you have limited access due to inclement weather, especially as I'm learning about the passes. <laughs> so some of the limitations are that we can certainly miss mild disease. We can miss rashes if they're faint. We can also miss mu muscle weakness if it's mild. And some children with juvenile dermatomyositis have arthritis, and so it is difficult for us to assess joint warmth and swelling. So if you can assess that your children and will ask you sometimes to feel the joints and see if they're warm or swollen, it can help, but we can certainly miss it if it's mild. And sometimes the labs may not be available at the time of the visit, which can make, you know, cinching up the entire visit into an actionable plan a little bit challenging. And sometimes, especially if the child is living remotely, we may recommend doing additional imaging like MRIs or x-rays or ultrasounds to help us make those decisions. And of course, last but not least, there are always technical difficulties that we can encounter. So things we want to know about, fevers and infections. Please do not wait for your appointment. Call us urgently. New or worsening rashes, take photos and send them to us before the appointment. New weakness, difficulty combing hair, brushing teeth, swallowing, voice changes, difficulty walking up and down the stairs or breathing difficulties. Let us know about them now or as soon as you can. And difficulty with medications, including side effects is really important to us. We can help you troubleshoot and we're here to partner with you. Um, but if we don't know that something is troubling, it's really hard for us to focus and work on those issues if we don't know about them. So during the visit, prior to us starting our discussion, we actually have a lot of legal jargon that we have to get through. And so you'll often hear us ask you silly questions or so seemingly silly questions. So we'll ask you who's, a, who's available to during the appointment. And most of the times we know who you are, but we have to ask. Um, and then importantly, where you are located. So like I said, we can only provide you telemedicine services in a state where we are licensed. And then of course, we are usually in Seattle, Washington or Bellevue, Washington. Um, and then we ask you to give us a verbal consent. We talk about the risks and benefits, like I mentioned before. Um, and we ask you if you have any additional questions, we ask you for, to consent to that. And then we can move on with our telemedicine visit. So you'll hear us ask all of those things. Sometimes we'll ask you for an ID if we haven't met you before because we have to verify that it is actually you coming in for the appointment. So during the visit, like Courtney mentioned, Simon says, so it's important for us to evaluate each and every body part clearly. Uh, we look to evaluate the joints and limb strength using, using modified muscle and joint exams, which may be limited due to multiple constraints. So what are we looking for? Similar things to what we're looking for in clinic. Warmth in the joints, swelling of the joints, decreased range of motion of the joints, pain with movement, pain with pressing over the muscles. And then you'll see us complete what we call a modified PLS. Um, so we, we may basically make you do a bunch of different movements to see if you have good range of motion and if you're able to move the joints properly. And then, like Courtney mentioned, we'll do a modified CMAS, the Childhood Myositis Assessment Scale. And so we are assessing muscular strength during that time. So we will ask the child to lay on the floor, we'll ask the, the child to put their hands up into the air, and we may ask you to kind of push back and provide some resistance to see how strong they are. Our wonderful Dr. Shinoy and Dr. Hayward are working on a paper right now, which is in press, but they've provided us with a few links, specifically practical tips to help us with telemedicine and rheumatology. So that is highlighted over here, which is great. And some of the virtual PGALS information as well. And so telemedicine and COVID, we had to ramp up with telemedicine pretty quickly, which we've done. Um, and I think that we are in an interesting time and an exciting time to continue to deliver telemedicine here at Seattle Children's. We are arranging specifically telemedicine visits remotely for patients who are located in Montana and Alaska, and those are our designated outreach sites at this time. And we're going to try to be flexible long-term. Um, institutional guidelines are continuously evolving, and so we will keep you updated about you know, how frequently we can do telemedicine and the logistics surrounding that. 
and other services such as nutrition and physical therapy have also been wonderfully integrated into telemedicine and um, we defer to them on how often they can do those specific telemedicine visits, but it also um, depends on their departmental guidelines. So thank you so much. Any questions? There are some questions. Great. Uh, one question is, is arthritis a common side effect of juvenile myositis or is it an overlap disease? That's an excellent question. Um, you can certainly have arthritis in juvenile dermatomyositis, but you can certainly have an overlap where um, the arthritis can be more symmetric and seem like juvenile arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So it can be both. And um, I know that sh a question I had was about insurance and telemed and what are you discovering at this point? That is a great question. Um, I am not privy to that information. <laughs> so everyone should be checking you know, our their, director their of insurance companies. <laughs> right. I can add that uh, most insurances are actually covering uh, telemedicine services. And because of the worldwide pandemic, because of COVID, uh, a lot of states are actually relaxing their um, rules. So Alaska and Montana have actually relaxed their uh, rules. So. I don't physically go to Montana, it's our wonderful Dr. Rosenwasser, but I'm actually able to start seeing patients in Montana over telemedicine now because some of the states, like you said, have relaxed their rules. Um, we have not heard any complaints about insurance not covering it. So if I don't hear complaints, I assume things are going well. So I think most <laughs> insurances are actually covering it really nicely. Um, and is there anything else that, uh, Dr. Rosenwasser, that you think would be helpful for parents when partnering with um, doctors, not just on telemedicine per se, but overall is that, you know, what's helpful to you as a practitioner that parents can be prepared with um, coming into a visit or a telemedicine visit? I think it's really important to be honest with us about um, how, you're, how you and your child are coping with the illness and how you and your child are coping with the medications. Um, if we don't know how you're feeling about certain things, we may not be able to change things for you and the child, and we don't want you to necessarily suffer in silence. So I think it's important to just be very open with us. Um, we have lots of options, lots of suggestions. We have nurses who have great experience and, and, you know, hacking, <laughs> I feel like that's the word, um, some of the, the issues surrounding some of the things that the ch children are facing. So I would say uh, the most important thing I think is communication, um, writing questions down, um, letting us know if you've read things or are interested in, uh, in studies that you've seen and, and maybe we can at least look into it or, um, you know, come up with an idea that might help you and your family. So the communication is, I think, the most important thing. And we may not take subtle cues. So if we're not taking your subtle cues, please just you know, blurt out your, your thoughts. We're also available through the portal. So if that's a more comfortable way um, to ask your questions, we encourage you to do that. And since I have Dorothy on the line, Dorothy, are you still there? I'm here, yeah. Is there anything that you would like parents um, and patients to know now that you're um, joining the clinic as a, a child psychologist, family therapist, um, anything that would be helpful uh, for you and, and how you might uh, work with patients and parents via telemedicine? Sure. I'm throwing, um, throwing you a big one. <laughs> sure. I have been in a clinic twice now, and Dr. Shinoy and I are playing around with different models of care. There are lots of different models of care for integrating therapy and psychology into uh, medical clinics. And right now, um, we have been playing around with me having a more sort of screening role where I am talking and meeting with each family checking in on different mental health concerns that might be most common, both in kids in general, but also with kids in uh, chronic illness involved, families and kids. Um, and we are 
open, I think, to being flexible with the model of care as it becomes apparent. So there are also ways of, of doing things where we might be able to meet with families for ongoing therapy more regularly. I think it all depends on, um, all depends on how many families want this kind of service and how much um, time we get to spend as psychologists in the clinic. So right now I think it's more of a screening and I'm happy, more than happy to meet with families and talk about concerns and provide all the resources that I can about um, establishing care with therapists in the community if necessary. And I think it's also a very valid um, route to look at having a integrated mental health provider who can do more of the therapy while you're in clinic. And you asked about telemedicine. Therapy is something that works pretty darn well um, in telemedicine because uh, we just talk most of the time. So I think that it's pretty exciting. Uh, as scary as COVID is, the aspect of increasing telemedicine and access for therapy has been really exciting for me. And um, I look forward to hopefully expanding more mental health presence in integrated care clinics as a result, because I could be in multiple places at once if I'm doing it through telemedicine. Um, yeah, so I just, I feel like I welcome, if you do have a clinic where you have an integrated care provider uh, in mental health, then I welcome all families to consider um, accessing that resource. It's usually not something that's easily accessed in the community. Lots of times there's long wait lists even to get an intake evaluation. And so I'm hoping that families will take advantage of the convenience of having somebody there with your doctors um, and getting started with therapy if it's merited and feeling free to ask that exact question um, to somebody who might help you evaluate that. I'm excited about the prospects. I think that's all the questions, but if you have more, I am here. <laughs> And Dr. Shinoy, you look like you might want to say something. Yeah, I was just going to add. Uh, so, you know, we as physicians get limited amount of time with the families. We have a half an hour and it's your time with us, right? In the myositis clinic, we, I have the luxury of having Courtney. And so we have slightly longer visits and Dorothy and everybody else is there too. But this is like the family's time. So the better prepared you are, the more it helps me. Um, I have this one model family, I can't say who it is, but this family, uh, the mom makes the kid write down the medications and write down their questions and they come with their little diary and the medications with the doses are on there and the questions are on there. So I know exactly how the visit is gonna go. Um, it helps me make sure all of the questions are addressed. Um, I am very picky about medication reconciliation, which is a big thing. I want to make sure that what we have on your chart is actually what the child is taking. So the better prepared you are, the more it helps me when I'm seeing that kid. So if you have questions, write them down before the visit so that you know, you're know you not going home and then saying, oh, I forgot to ask this, I forgot to ask that. Thank you. Um, um, any other questions? Sorry, go ahead, Shannon. Um, I was just gonna share um, something that Dr. Um, Andrew Heaton had asked that we share with the families, which was, um, I don't know if you can see this, if you guys have your screens up, but I'll send out a link um, in the chat and the email. It's a nice little $100 microscope that um, can be delivered in a day or two um, and can be used to take those nail fold pictures that Dr. Shinoy showed, showed us a couple of slides back um, at a pretty good resolution, I think. Would you agree, Dr. Shinoy? It's, um, it seemed like it was better than my phone. So um, I'll send you guys that link if that's something that you're gonna continue, if your family's gonna continue with telemed, um, you might be interested in looking into. I've used it for a number of years. It was really a great little, well, we, we have one in the clinic too. We're yeah. gonna upgrade it, but <laughs> yeah. Any other Questions for Dr. Rosenwasser about telemed or about with for Dr. Shinoy with partnering? I'm interested about the microscope. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, sure, I'll send it um, by email, Joan. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? See, we have Barb Limbach who's joined us, Jennifer, anyone that I'm not 
catching Alma. Um, I was thinking maybe you could stop the slide part. Natalie, that'd be great. So we can see, I can see people's. There we go, that's great. Okay. Okay, well, we do have time. So um, I really wanna make sure people get their questions answered. Um, we also have time for some just um, sharing back and forth with families here. Um, anything that uh, we have some ongoing uh, webinars coming up, which I'm gonna let Shannon tell us about and maybe Simonetta can tell us about too. I wanna just encourage everybody to stay connected to CureJM and to know that we did a really great job of raising money with the uh, Walk Across America. We have our holiday challenge coming up because of course COVID has affected everybody's finances, including ours at CureJM. So we've been really, um, we've been really fortunate, I think, in having our families be super supportive and we cannot be more grateful and thankful for what you've done so far. And I, you know, we really want to try to keep up our research projects and add some if we can. And as you heard earlier, for those who were on earlier and heard, uh, Jim Minow, we are potentially looking at a, running a clinical trial for a steroid replacement called Bemorolone. And eventually, in the next couple of years, we're going to have to raise close to a million dollars in order to push that project forward. It, it will be the first ever clinical trial that we've been running specifically. So um, we have some steps before we get there. We have some great uh, talks coming up with the FDA. And um, I cannot tell you how excited we are about all of the projects that we're involved with. And I cannot tell you how extremely excited I am about our Center of Excellence at Children's Hospital in Seattle. So um, I'm gonna open it up and people can take themselves off mute. Raise your hand if you want to say something or ask a question. Um, anything else from the doctors and Courtney that we haven't shared that you're thinking about first that maybe you wanna. Uh, we just wanna say we love the clinic too. Thank you for <laughs> allowing us to do it. I think it's really, um, improve the health of the care of kids with dermatomyositis because um, I think kind of doing some of the standardized assessments and following through with that is really great. Um, you know, most often in our regular routine clinic, we don't have the luxury of PT. Um, I often warn the kids saying that Courtney is going to be much, much harder than I am. Uh, uh, and so it's, I really think that it's been a great thing for families and us to all together. Um, we talked a little bit about our research partner in the clinic, which is Dr. Christian Lude, and he's at the UW. Uh, his lab is at South Lake Union, so at SLU, and he partnered with us in doing some of the research around callosinosis. So it's really a great um, model of collaborative care, I think, because each one has their own piece and is a master in that piece, like Dr. Lude in his research, Courtney in her PT, me with our physical uh, and clinical assessments. And then I think we're really pioneering um, the psychologist, which no other clinic has done this kind of model. So um, it's a little scary because it's new, but it's also really exciting because it's new and it gives um, Dorothy and I the flexibility to do it the way we want to do it. Um, so I think it's nice to have um, have them there as well. So we always welcome ideas. Um, and sometimes I think the families give us the best ideas. So the more vocal families are about their ideas, the better it is for us and the better it'll help us build this clinic. Um, so thank you. Thank you to the Cure Jam. Thank you to Suzanne for all her leadership. Thank you to Shannon, Jim, everybody. Thank you. Um, we also want to mention that we that you all have started a clinic in Bellevue as well, which is very exciting. Would you just mention the days that the actual clinics are running both Seattle and Bellevue? 
Yeah, so the Bellevue Clinic, we started it a couple of months ago. When was our first one? August, yes, August. August 5th was our first one. And um, both the clinics are once a month. The Seattle Clinic is on the third Thursday of each month, and the Bellevue Clinic is on the first Wednesday of each month. So actually, next week, we have our Bellevue Clinic. Um, I will also add that we do have the flexibility of doing telemedicine or an in-person visit during the um, myositis clinic. Um, and Courtney does has pioneered the way of doing the entire CMAS over telemedicine. So we can actually get a full CMAS score. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you do? Uh, well, I found a Barbie to help me. Um, and she's got bendable joints. And so I can use the Barbie because it's especially with the screen, it's been really difficult to kind of get my whole body in to demonstrate what I'm asking. Um, like I said, the CMAS has some maneuvers that are like very silly to explain. So one of them, you kind of start on your back, tuck your arms in, roll to your right onto your stomach and then shoot your arms out. Um, which, so I just described it and you can tell a kid would probably be like, what? <laughs> so we just used the Barbie um, and it worked out pretty well. So we had the CMAS, I can't do the MMT8 over telemedicine, unfortunately, but um, yeah, we at least have that one really nice tool. I wanted to mention there was a question about exercise and the research project that we're doing in Toronto with um, Dr. Feldman. He's looking at exercise and CoQ10 and is it glucosamine? There was another supplement that he's looking at in terms of being able to right away from diagnosis, see if we can prevent some of the um, uh, breakdown of muscle and try to keep muscle stronger. So uh, we do have a summary on our website, curejm.org, that looks at all of the current research that we're doing. Um, and I'd be happy to talk offline more about that. I don't have it right in front of me, so um, I would have to go and, and look for that. Yeah, so there are a whole host of things. There's, uh, like Dr. Shinoy mentioned, there is the genetic aspect of things. So if um, you have a particular mutation in the genes, um, it can predict a more, you know, severe course that might require additional medications. And some patients have what we call a monocyclic course, which is one major episode, and then they can go into remission. And some patients respond really nicely to certain medications and not other medications. So it's really a whole host of things that um, taken into the grand larger picture that um, tell us whether or not someone can go into remission and whether they'll stay in remission. I just want to give a big thanks again to Dr. Susan Chenoy, Dr. Natalie Rosenwasser, and to our fabulous PT, Courtney Inter. Oh, we do have one more question. Um, um, the, Someone's daughter was on a dose of prednisolone decreasing. She was diagnosed this past August, taking 7.5 milligrams in the morning, three milligrams in the afternoon. Next week, she'll be at one milligram in the afternoon. Will it lower more after that? So our goal always with prednisone is to lower it as, as much as we can in a, in a way that is safe and that does not flare disease. So, um, you know, if your child is doing well at the next visit, likely they will decrease the prednisone more. It just depends on all the different factors like Dr. Shinoy mentioned, your skin, your muscles, your labs. Um, you know, we, our goal is to get you off of as many medications as possible without you flaring. Right, there's no one size fits all as we wanna keep saying. So everybody's different and, that's why it's really, really important that you talk with your doctors about everything, write your questions down, um, and, and, don't, and you know, don't be afraid to ask over and over again if you do not understand. Thanks again to our wonderful Seattle Children's staff. And um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. It yeah, really thank you lovely. all for joining. It's really nice to see some familiar faces on there. So thank you all for joining.